think uh, we should get started, all right? Um, so I somehow managed to grade all the homework uh, over this weekend, okay? Uh, I think most of you guys are doing pretty good. Um, so the, the main idea is, um, is either, either the homework or the exams are gonna be similar or, or gonna be, um, well, it's, it's not going to be very different from the, uh, from the contents that we'll, we'll learn from the class. I would say when you prepare for either the midterm or the final, uh, try to focus on the uh, class notes and also the uh, homework problems. So I, I did notice that some of you missed a few homework problems and uh, the way I grade it is each problem takes 10 points, right? If you miss one problem, that's quite a big loss for your uh, entire score. So if you want to resubmit, I know some, some of you maybe even missed three or four problems. So that will cause a, quite a significant change in your score. So if you want to resubmit, feel free to resubmit. I'll read them and add the points uh, back to your uh, homework points, okay? So um, the other thing is, um, so I, I did notice that there are some common problems that uh, you guys probably didn't understand very well in the homework. So uh, I will review these questions in our review session before the midterm. Right? So our midterm is maybe in two weeks, right? So we'll go through those common problems maybe next week. So uh, it's better for preparation of the midterm, okay? Um, so I think in the future, I'll grade the homework more um, uh, with a better schedule so we, we can get a faster response and also try to make use of the office hours. So if you have any questions about any problems, you can either email me or, or just come to the office hour. I, th I prefer to discuss over the office hour, right? If uh, I did get a few emails like uh, the night before the, the, due, the due time, right? So uh, sometimes I might not be able to respond to you really quickly, all right? Uh, so this class, we're going to learn a new PM removal device, that is a filtration. And typically we call them as backhouse filters. So uh, this class will just um, briefly introduce how does the filtration work, right? Uh, so again, before we introduce the new contents, we should uh, uh, do a recap, right? So basically in our last class, we talked about the ESP, either the design of the ESP or the calculation of the ESP. So the major problem is that we want to know how many plates or what is the plate area, collection area of the ESP, okay? So we mentioned that the ESP or electrostatic precipitator is composed of multiple mechanical fields, right? For, for example, this one is composed of three mechanical fields. So the number of mechanical field is three, right? So there are also multiple plates inside. So we use the lowercase n to represent the, the plate number in each mechanical field. Right? So by using the Dosh equation, right? So we can refer, uh, we can relate the total collection area with the collection efficiency. So we can do the calculation to first find out the minimum required collection area. And then we should do a more practical design, right? Because there's not going to be half of the plate. And also each of the mechanical field have to be identical, right? So it should be composed of the total number of plates is M multiplied by N. But if we talk about the total collection area, then that's going to be equal to M multiplied by N minus one multiplied by AP, right? The AP, is the area of the plate on both sides, right? So that's the general idea. And I think you have quite a few homework problems on the practical, practical design of the ESP, right? So uh, this is the example problem that we went through during the class. We mentioned that uh, there is some problems uh, with, the, um, with the method that's shown on the textbook, right? So the way it solves is the problem, <coughs> Excuse me, but it solved the problem is basically expanding the m multiplied by m minus one, right? So um, the textbook basically uh, equate 
the N, the 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 the, the capital N with the um, M multiplied by N, and minus two is the minus M here. So M N minus M, right? So there are two sections or two mechanical fields. And there are some problems because the final uh, number of plates have to be divisible by the number of uh, mechanical fields, right? So that is a general idea. Um, so uh, if you recall, I think a few weeks back, um, there was some technical issue that we, we couldn't talk about the uh, class according to schedule. And at that time, I introduced a few methods to measure the particle size distribution, right? So at that time, I specifically mentioned that there is a method that's using electrical static field or uh, the device that's called the DMA. So basically, uh, what happens is that uh, we're going to use the movement of the particles to classify them based on their size. So this is uh, going to be related to the migration velocity. So we remember that migration velocity W there. Uh, so in the ESP, we can find this W, or we can calculate this W based on some uh, experience um, uh, tables there. Um, but in general, uh, when we measure the particle size distributions, what we're going to do is we're going to charge these particles, no matter what their size is, we'll give them only a single charge, okay? No matter how large they are, we can use a device to give them just a single charge on them. So if they have a single charge, then we can basically calculate what is the migration velocity of the particle in this, in this uh, electrostatic field. So again, I'll introduce the principle of this classifier here. So uh, we basically, we typically call this as the electrostatic uh, classifier. Okay, so based on this name, it's classifying particles based on their sizes. So let's assume that all the particles carry one single charge, uh, plus one charge, no matter how large they are or how small they are, they all carry a positive one charge. And then at the same time, we'll connect this upper plate to a high voltage. Let's say this is a positive polarity, high voltage. And then, the bottom plate is connected to the ground, okay? So because of the electrostatic force, we're going to repel these particles, right? It's because they, uh, they have the same polarity. So the particles will move in this way. But at the same time, we're introducing a clean, we call that the sheath flow, or the protection flow, right? So it doesn't have any particle in there. So because of that, we know that the particles will have a horizontal velocity. Let's say we're analyzing this particle, right? So it's going to have a horizontal velocity that's given by the horizontal sheath flow. And then because all of these particles, we're talking about submicron particles. Right? because their size is so small, so they will carry the same horizontal velocity. Let's assume that they have the same horizontal velocity, right? So no matter which final trajectory they use, they will use the same, they will have the same horizontal velocity. So the only difference is that their vertical velocity or the migration velocity is going to be different, right? So the way we can calculate that is again by using the drag force, right? Because the particles are moving, um, there's a relative velocity between the particle and the, the sheath flow in terms of the vertical direction there, right? So the way we calculate the migration velocity is by balancing the electrostatic force with the drag force, right? So again, the drag force is equal to three pi mu dp divided by c multiplied by v, right? So the V here is the migration velocity, which is a W, okay? So now we can calculate what is a W, right? So um, basically here we can have W equal to QEC divided by three pi mu dp. So remember our assumption there. So 
all the particles carry plus one charge, right? So, so we know that the number of charge or the charge that's carried by, by the particle are all the same, right? So this is in a parallel plate. Basically, once we fix the voltage on here, so the, the electrostatic uh, field strains is just V divided by D, right? V is the voltage, D is the distance, right? So that's also a constant. This is constant, this is constant. The C is dependent on particle size, but let's say that, uh, let's now assume that the particle, the C here, we can assume that's close to one, okay? So this is a constant, the viscosity is a constant, so only thing that's not a constant is the particle size, okay? So here we can see that the larger the particle size, the smaller the migration velocity, right? So what that means is, the larger, let's say this is the largest particle, then it's going to have the slowest velocity that's moving towards the, the plate here, okay? Well, the smallest particle are going to have the largest migration velocity. Largest particle just have a smaller migration velocity and middle-sized particle have a middle uh, magnitude of the uh, migration velocity. And now at the same time, we're saying that all of them have the same horizontal velocity, okay? So here I have a question, right? So because their migration velocity will be different, they're going to be separated into different trajectories. Right? So here I have a question. So which tra trajectory corresponds to the smallest particle? Right? So again, I'm re um, uh, restating the problem here. Okay, so particles of three different sizes are introduced into the parallel plate. Well, a horizontal flow gives them the same horizontal velocity, right? Particles are singly charged and the gravity can be ignored. Which trajectory represents that of the smallest particles? So let's do a a quick quiz here. So is that gonna be the left or the right? So I don't think it's gonna be the middle, right? So five more seconds. All right, I don't think the results will change anymore. Um, so unfortunately, it's the left, it's the left trajectory, okay? So, so this time, uh, um, obviously the fewer side got the correct answer, okay? So uh, the reason behind that is basically, we were saying that, let's say, um, let's put some symbols here. Let's say for the smallest size, it has the uh, migration velocity of W1, middle size W2, large size W3, okay? So we have the relationship of W1 larger than W2 larger than W3, mainly because remember the equation here? The smaller the particle size, the larger the migration velocity, right? So now it's just a matter of how fast do these particles collide with the, um, the lower plate there? So the way we calculate that is just by using D divided by W1, right? So that is a time that's required for the smallest particle to collide with the lower plate, okay? So D divided by W1 smaller than D divided by W2 smaller than D divided by W3. So this is a, basically the residence time of the particles within this parallel plate, right? And then we can calculate what is the horizontal distance to travel. Basically, we're assuming that they have the same horizontal velocity, right? We can just multiply that by the horizontal velocity, which we can assume to be U here. U multiplied by U multiplied by U. So this is the horizontal distance that the particles travel, right? So what this means is a smaller particle, the smallest particle will travel the shortest 
horizontal distance, while the largest particle will travel the longest distance, while the particles with the middle size can travel with the middle distance. Okay. So um, simply what, what this means is that if we, let's say, take a outlet of at the uh, end of this parallel plate, then only particles with a specific size, only particles with a specific size can go through this slit here, go through this outlet slit. Okay. So this basically satisfies the function of the classifier. Right? So we give it, give it a certain voltage. You can only classify particles with a specific size. Right? But how do we measure the size distribution? So the way we do that is we'll just change the voltage applied here. Right? Let's say if we want to um, measure the particles with larger size, if we want to measure the particles with larger size, then we just need to increase the migration velocity of the larger particles, right? Because originally it will travel to here. And if we want to uh, basically to, dra to drag them to this trajectory, what we do is we have to shorten its resonance time. To shorten the resonance time, we need to increase its migration velocity, right? So that can be done by increasing the field strings or the high voltage, right? So if you want to measure very small particles, we have to increase its resonance time. Basically means that we need to reduce its uh, migration velocity, right? To move the trajectory to here. So we have to reduce the high voltage on the, um, on the uh, parallel plate. So in this way, by changing the high voltage, we can change what size of particle will come out, right? So in this way, we can achieve the function of measuring particles with different sizes. So this is, uh, using the, basically using the mechanism of the uh, electrostatic force to uh, help us achieve the um, classification of the particles, right? So again, I'm showing some commercialized instruments, right? So this instrument directly uses this parallel plate, right? Inside it, you have particles with different sizes and they can travel with different trajectories. Right? The larger particles will use uh, this trajectory here, smaller particles use this trajectory here, right? So I also mentioned that in terms of parallel plate, it's quite difficult to um, manage its flow field, right? So uh, what happens is uh, it really depends on how how wide, what is the distance in, in this direction, right? So we have to make sure that plates are parallel to each other very accurately and also uh, we need. We also need to consider the edge effect because the flow at the edge of the plate are not going to be the same as the flow in the middle. So it's going to be a there's going to be a flow profile. So that's why people came up with a better design. Um, so instead of using the parallel plates, we use two columns, right? So theoretically, these two columns are still parallel to each other, right? Inner column and outer column, right? So the inner column carry certain high voltage, all the column is connected to the ground. It's not the other way around, otherwise people will get shocked when we touch it, right? So the outer column is grounded, inner column has high voltage. So in this way, we can attract particles to the, uh, to the inner column here, while the smaller particles can travel only for a short distance, while the larger particles can travel for a longer distance, okay? So this is again based on different migration velocities, right? So by, again, by scanning the voltage, we can scan the size distribution of the particles. Um, so there's um, so this device is called the differential mobility analyzer. So it's based on the electrical mobility of the particles, but fundamentally, it's using the electrostatic force uh, that's acting on the particle by balancing the drag force and the electrostatic force, right? Um, so these are some um, pictures of the commercialized instruments. Um, yeah, I forgot to share the results. Okay, so we had a, uh, I think we had a close tie here, I guess. But again, um, I'll say more people probably didn't uh, get this idea quite clearly. So, um, well, maybe we can just do a, a relaunch of the pool. Right, to make sure that you 
understand this. So again, I'll show the picture here. Okay, we'll stop here. All right, so uh, I think there are still three students who didn't get this idea. So uh, feel free to let me know or discuss with others, All right? Um, okay, so I would say that's all for the, um, for the ESP or regarding the electrostatic force. So this class, we're going to learn about a new um, method or uh, particle removal, and this is called the filtration. And in industries, we refer this filtration method or, or we uh, design the setup, and then the setup is typically called the backhouse filters. Okay, so in terms of filtration, I think uh, you guys are probably quite familiar with that, right? For example, in our um, campus buildings typically have those H, uh, HVAC systems, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And the ventilation will, will rely on these filtration, okay, to clear off the particles. And at home, maybe you have the uh, furnace filters. Sometimes you need to replace the, uh, the filters, right? So the filter works um, by um, basically removing particles with a few different mechanisms, right? And you can see that as a sieve, right? By blocking all the larger particles, but also at the same time, if the particle size is very small, which behave like molecules, then their um, Brownian motion or the diffusion are going to block these particles, okay? So we'll talk, talk about that later, right? So typically the filters are composed of very thin fibers, right? So here it's showing a, a schematic diagram of a filter uh, that we commonly use. Um, they're typically composed of some fibers. The so fibers are uh, commonly have a, si have a diameter of 100 to 150 microns. And the gap between the fibers are 50 to 75 microns. Okay? So in this case, if the particle size is larger than 75 micron, then they're going to get blocked. Right? But uh, as we said, the particles with very small sizes, they can diffuse and then also get collided onto the, the fiber here and then can also get, uh, get removed, okay? Um, so there are quite many types of filters, and I think you probably have heard of the name that's called the HEPA filter. So the HEPA filter is a series of filter, right? It doesn't mean a filter that's having certain uh, high efficiency, okay? It can have a series of, a range of, uh, filtration, uh, a range of particle removal efficiencies. So the HEPA means high efficiency particulate air, Okay, so HEPA filter. Okay. So in general, these filters can reach to a collection efficiency of almost 100%. Okay, so if you compare <clears throat> the devices that we have already learned, the cyclones, right, we mentioned it's 60 to 90%, right? And the ESP can reach to as high as 99%. And for filters, it's almost 100%. So again, we're talking about the mass removal efficiency. So we mentioned that, um, for example, for the ESP, it's not very efficient for very small particles, but the small particle are not going to contribute to the mass. That's why, uh, although it's 99%, we may still have quite many small particles getting leaked from the system, okay? Um, and also, um, Basically, the HEPA filter can have very high efficiency. And then there are also some filters that can give us uh, completely 100% efficiency, okay? So uh, that error generated from the filter is called the zero error, okay? So zero error means there are zero particles, okay? 
So basically, the, the filtration efficiency is so high that no particles can penetrate through, no matter what their size is, right? So then you may wonder, why do we need it? Why do we need a zero air, right? So uh, because let's say in the indoor environment, there are already, let's say, 2,000, a few thousand, a few thousand particles, right? We're not exactly uh, inhaling very clean air, right? And especially when we cook, let's say, uh, the smell that you, uh, like the, the pleasant smell that you uh, get from cooking, right? So those are particles, right? So we don't necessarily want to remove those particles. But why do we still need the zero air, right? It's not uh, just showing that people can do that, but actually it has very important applications. Right? So um, I would say the most scenario that we need these zero air are in the semiconductor industry. Okay, so we have heard of um, computer CPUs with different generations, right? So for different generations, one thing we know is that um, they're basically putting more wires, putting more components within the same size of the chip, right? So uh, right now, I think. Um, Intel have the i9 CPU, right? Um, I think there are a few models available, but not um, it's not being applied to a lot of uh, computers. We all, um, I think most of the computers use uh, either i5 or i7, right? So the major difference in terms of the configuration of the chip is basically the, how many wires or how many micro components we can place there, right? So um, if, you, if you're familiar with these semiconductors, so basically there is um, significant improvement regarding the gap between the, let's say the conducting components and the non-conducting components. Let's say um, if these two wires are conductive and then the gap between these are basically uh, limiting how many micro devices or how many nano devices we can put on the chip, right? For example, for I5, I think the distance is somewhere around tens of nanometer, which is very narrow, right? I9 can even go to five or six nanometer. So by limiting this gap here, we can put in more devices in there, right? So um, basically uh, in the semiconducting, the size of the devices is very important, right? And now if you think about what is the air that we're inhaling in the indoor or outdoor environments? So we mentioned that the, um, typically when we use the cyclone to measure the size distribution, it's talking about micro, uh, micrometer particles. But uh, at the same time in the atmosphere, uh, the particles with the most concentration are around hundreds of nanometers, right? So, Hundreds of nanometer. If we compare it to that, compare that to this very thin distance here, it is very large, right? So if we make those microchips with with very narrow gaps, and then suddenly a large particle, say it's large, but actually their size is very small. If we have a very a single particle that's depositing onto this uh, chip here, then it's going to damage the entire device, right? Mainly because um, these are the limiting factors. Right, so that's why we need zero air in these environments when we manufacture the semiconductors. Right? And uh, these environments also have their own name. It's called the clean room. Okay, so it has to satisfy a lot of standards to um, basically to certify a clean room, which have um, literally no particles in there. Right. Um, so this is why we want to apply the filters. And this is actually going to an extreme, but in industries, let's say in coal-fired power plants, we also want to use these uh, filters, mainly because um, some of the coal particles or some of the manufacturing industry may generate toxic particles. And if they're toxic, contain, let's say, higher concentration of mercury or lead, uh, they may cause some health issues, right? So under that situation, we also want to use the filter to completely remove them, that it's not going to ha uh, cause a house hazard, right? So um, 
I would say that maybe in a lot of the scenario when you uh, know filters, place the furnace filters, uh, the filters look like uh, panels, right? So they have the flat uh, filters or they have the pleated um, filters, right? So they have different geometries. <clears throat> but in industry, uh, the device we use is called the uh, filter bags, okay? So they are going to look like these. So what happens is uh, we'll make, uh, basically use some metals to form a structure of this bag, and then we'll cover the structure with the filter bag. You see the filter bag only have one inlet, right? So you can pull this inlet towards this structure here, and then you can form this column of filter here. And we can easily re re replace these uh, filter bags in different types, types of PM removal devices, okay? So in terms of the uh, detailed geometry, when we apply the backhouse filters, so what happens is the air is going to flow from this opening here. Well, that's the uh, air outlet, and then the air inlets are just going to go through the filter media, right? So in this way, we can remove the particles and then generate the clean air out of it, okay? So this is the general idea of the filters, and in terms of the particle remo removal mechanisms. There are quite many different um, mechanisms that we, where we can apply to the filters. Okay. So um, initially, when we learn about the cascade impactors, we introduce the mechanism that's called the impaction. So the impaction is being applied to very large particles. where particle size is generally above one micro, okay? So the way it works is, let's say we have a fiber here, right? So if we have a very large particle, so the way it's going to uh, move, it's just going to uh, follow a straight line here, right? So we have multiple of these fibers, and then this large particle will just collide with the, um, with the fiber, so without, because um, although the airflow can go past these fibers, but because the particles has a very large size, a very, very large inertia, it's just going to collide with the fibers here. So this is called the impaction. So we can also have the interception. So what happens to interception is, let's say the air can go around the fiber here, but because the particles have a diameter, right? They have a large enough diameter. So there's um, basically their outer surface can get in touch with the fiber here, right? So um, because of their con this contact here, the particles can get stick onto the surface. Okay? It's a little bit different from the impaction. Impaction means um, fully coll collision with the surface, while the interception just means that um, this is an extreme situation where their surface touch with the fiber, right? So this is um, basically um, the particles can uh, nearly escape from the filter here, but they still, unfortunately, they get captured by the um, fiber here. Okay, so this is called the interception. And the interception also applies for larger particles because you, you have to give the particles a significant diameter where they can get intercepted by the, uh, by the fiber, okay? So we we'll also have the diffusion. The diffusion works as uh, for very small particles. Let's say particles below 100 nanometer or 0.1 micrometer, okay? So diffusion is very significant when the particle size is getting close to the size of molecules. So what happens is when the particles move uh, towards a target, then a lot of air molecules are going to collide with the particle. The particles are going to fall, uh, follow, like, let's say, this random motion here. So if they have the random motion that basically expands their trajectory, right? As the originally, the particles might have a diameter of 100 nanometer, but their trajectory cross-section area might reach to around one micro or a few microns. 
okay? So if they expand their trajectory, then they can also get captured by the fiber here, right? So this is a diffusion, okay? So I would say most of the uh, fabric filters, let's say, um, I think right now we're required to wear the face mask, right? The face covering. So a lot of um, the, um, the fabric, let's say the cotton or the silk masks, they're using these three mechanisms, right? Um, so very large particles, they can collide onto the uh, mask material, right? Very small particles, they can use diffusion. Um, to get captured, right? But uh, one thing we also notice is that these uh, fabric materials or the fabric uh, masks, they have relatively low filtration efficiency, okay? So that's why people invented new materials where you can also give them electrostatic interaction to the particles, okay? So instead of uh, letting all of these fabrics to be neutral, we can make them as the material called the electric materials. Okay, so the electric materials are basically some materials that's carrying um, positive and negative charge on, on different, uh, at different locations of the fiber, okay? So let's say it can carry positive charge on left, left side and then the negative charge on the right side, okay? So when the particles pass through this material, we can create an um, effect that's called the dipole effect or the induced dipole. So basically what happens is, let's say the fiber has a positive charge on the left side, then it's going to attract the electrons to the right side of the particles, while the left side of the particle will carry positive charge, right? And because of this induced dipole, the particles can get attracted by the material and then further get collected, okay? So for these materials that's using the ele uh, electrostatic uh, interaction, uh, we can make them much thinner. Okay? We can make, make the uh, fabric, uh, we can make these fibers much thinner and we don't need a very dense packing of the material, okay? So that's why we can divide uh, all of the filters into two types, it's either fabric filters or the fibrous filter, okay? Fabric filters are using the top three mechanism. Well, fibrous filters using all of, all of the four mechanisms. Okay, so uh, nowadays, I think you guys are also quite familiar with different types of masks, right? We have the surgical mask, we have these cotton or the, uh, made of, uh, like let's say the DIY mask made of t-shirt, bandana, so on. Um, so we also have the N95 materials, N95 masks, right? So among these masks or these filters, right? So the DIY masks, I would say most of them are just fabric filter. Well, for the N95 or the surgical mask or the household air filters, let's say the furnace filters. Okay, so they are fibrous filters because they are using the electrostatic interaction, which will give us a much higher filtration efficiency. So basically, uh, this additional mechanism will significantly, significantly bump up the performance of the masks or of the filter material, okay? So here I have a short video introducing the N95 materials. Maybe we can, um, maybe we can go through the, video really quickly. So I'm gonna share. There's always people that say evolution is just random.
Prior to March 2020, there's a good chance you didn't know what an N95 mask was, or at least didn't think about them unless you were doing a home repair project with lots of dust, or live in a part of the world with crazy pollution or wildfire smoke. And upon learning about them, you might think, like I did, that an N95 mask is basically a really, really fine strainer, a mesh of fibers with gaps too small for dust and other airborne particles to get through. A strainer filters out particles larger than its openings, but not particles smaller than its openings. So you'd expect that with a mask, after a certain point, small enough particles will sneak through. But this isn't how N95 masks work. The particles they filter are generally much smaller than the gaps between the fibers in the mask. What's more, an N95 mask is actually really good at filtering both the largest and smallest small particles. It's medium-sized small particles that are hardest for it to block. This isn't at all like a strainer because N95s are much cleverer than strainers. The overarching goal of an N95 mask is instead to get an airborne particle to touch a fiber in the mask. Regardless of how big an airborne particle is, once it touches a fiber, it stays stuck to it and doesn't become airborne again. This isn't anything special about the fibers, but about the size of the particles. At a microscopic scale, everything is sticky, because the weakly attractive force between molecules is more than strong enough to hold very, very small things in place. So you shouldn't think of N95 masks like a fine window screen that keeps insects of a certain size out. You should think of them more like a sticky spider web that can catch an insect of any size as long as it touches a strand. And so N95 masks use a bunch of different clever physics and mechanical tricks to get particles to touch their fibers. First, many spider webs are better than one. Unlike strainers, where stacking many identical ones doesn't improve the filtering at all, more layers of sticky fibers means more chances for particles to get stuck. And how likely particles are to hit or miss a fiber depends in large part on their size. Airborne particles larger than a thousandth of a millimeter basically travel in straight lines because of their inertia. And because there are so many layers of fibers, their straight line paths are essentially guaranteed to hit a fiber and stick. Airborne particles that are really, really small are so light that collisions with air molecules literally bounce them around, so they move in a random zigzag pattern known as Brownian motion. So this is the uh, diffusion that we talked about, right? And earlier, I would say this is the inertial impaction. Molecules literally bounce them around, so they move in a random zigzag pattern known as Brownian motion. This zigzagging also makes it super likely that a particle will bump into a fiber and get stuck. Particles of in-between sizes are the hardest to filter. That's because they don't travel in straight lines, and they also don't bounce around randomly. Instead, they're carried along with the air as it flows around fibers, meaning they're likely to get carried past fibers and sneak through even a mask with many layers. So you see here, if they happen to get stuck while following streamlines, it's called captured by interception, right? So this is just that the particles, if they have a large enough diameter, if they touch the surface of the fiber, they can also get captured by interception. Layers. But N95 masks have a final trick up their sleeve. They can attract particles of all sizes to them using an electric field. In the presence of an electric field, even neutral particles develop an internal electrical imbalance which attracts them to the source of the field. This is why neutrally charged styrofoam sticks to a cat whose fur has been charged with static electricity. But unlike a cat's fur, an N95 mask's electric field isn't just ordinary static electricity. The fibers are like permanent magnets, but for electricity, electrets. Just like you can permanently magnetize a piece of iron by putting it in a strong enough magnetic field, you can electritize a piece of plastic to give it a permanent electric field. By electritizing the fibers in an N95 mask, they gain a long-lasting ability to attract particles, which means they capture about 10 times as many particles as regular fibers. And this is, after all, the point of an N95 mask, to filter out particles from the air, and they do it cleverly. By taking advantage of the molecular scale stickiness of matter, using many layers of fibers that catch straight moving large particles as well as zigzagging small particles, and having an electric field that attracts all particles, you get a mask, not a strainer, that's really good at trapping both large and small airborne particles, and does a reasonably good job at filtering out middle-sized airborne particles. Precisely what fraction of those sneaky medium-sized particles get blocked gives you the number of the mask. If at least 95% of those particles are filtered out, then the mask is rated N95. Okay, so um, here you know where the term of N95 come out, right? So it's because of the, um, the collection efficiency or the removal efficiency at 0.3 micrometer is uh, 95%, right? So you may wonder what are the filtration efficiency of other materials, right? So for example, surgical masks or uh, furnace filters. So if you're interested, you can uh, always come to my group and then take a look at the device we have. So we have been analyzing a lot of these common 
um, masks in their filtration efficiency. So typically for the surgical masks, the um, filtration efficiency at 0 0.3, mi uh, 0.3 micrometer is around 60%. Well, for the furnace filters or com common household air filters, uh, their filtration efficiency can be around, let's say, uh, 70 or 80%, right? So it really depends on the rating of these filters. You might have heard of MERV 13, MERV 15, and so on. So generally, the higher the numbers or the higher the ratings, the better the filtration efficiency, okay? Um, so this is basically the mechanism of the particle removal. So one thing that um, the video mentioned about mentioned about is the um, it's basically the how thick the material is right so it mentions that n95 have multiple layers of the filter material right and then uh, that is also the reason why we generally um, when we breathe through the n95 material we can feel a strong flow resistance right it's quite difficult to breathe through the materials so it is mainly because of their thickness right so um, but on the other hand, uh, I would say no matter how, how thick the material is, if we talk about a term that's called the filter quality or the how good the material is, it shouldn't depend on their thickness, right? It should just be purely dependent on what material it's using. Because if we stack two layers of N95, it doesn't mean that N95, two layers of N95, the quality is better than one layer of N95 because the quality should be intrinsic to the material there. So then how do we isolate this um, thickness and also the performance of the filter, okay? So let's say, for example, we're talking about a layer of uh, N95 material, okay? So we know that N95 have very good filtration efficiency, but also at the same time, it has pretty high pressure drop or the flow resistance, okay? But now if we stack two layers, of these. So we know that the filtration C will become, uh, filtration efficiency will become even higher, but all, at the same time, the pressure drop will also become higher, okay? So the idea is that the filter quality, if we talk about the quality of the N95, it shouldn't be dependent on how many layer we're talking about, okay? So let's say, for example, if we um, try to calculate what is the, um, uh, what is the dependence of the efficiency and pressure drop on the thickness? Okay, so typically, um, what people find out is that the pressure drop is proportional to the thickness of the uh, material. So this D here is the thickness. It's the thickness of the uh, future material, okay? So if we have two layers of N95, then that's just going to be the new delta, uh, delta P is going to be twice of the D here, multiplied by a constant C, okay? So uh, what we know is that one layer of material, let's say its filtration efficiency is eta and delta P, then two layers of material, that's gonna be two delta P, three layers of material, that's gonna be three delta P. But in terms of the filtration efficiency, that shouldn't be two eta and three eta, right? Because here we already have 95%. Two layers is already over 100, right? So we mentioned that we always need to consider what is the penetrated particles, right? So the penetrated particles are one minus eta multiplied by one minus eta, and then use one to minus this thing, okay? So uh, basically, <clears throat> through one layer of the, um, if we were talking about particles through one layer of the N95, then the penetrated fraction is going to be one minus E, right? And if we're talking about the penetrated particles through, through two layers, then the penetrated fraction should be one minus E multiplied by one minus E, right? And then uh, the filtration efficiency of two layers of the material should be one minus this penetrated fraction, right? So it should be one minus, one minus E, to the power of two, right? And then for three layers of material, it should be one minus, one minus eta to the power of three, okay? So how do we arrange a equation that can relate these parameters to the filter quality, okay? So people actually define an equation. Filter quality is defined as the log 
of y minus eta divided by delta p, where, where eta is the filtration efficiency of the materials, and delta p is the pressure drop. So in this situation, let's say if we want to calculate what is the, uh, the performance of one layer of the material, then if we plug in the values, then that should, this is just going to be one e, uh, log of 1 minus eta divided by delta p, right? And for two layers, then that's going to be log of 1 minus here, 1 minus 1 minus eta to the power of 2, and divide by 2 delta p. Okay, so this is filtration efficiency, log of the one minus filtration efficiency and divide by two delta p. So you can see that here, you can get this one canceled and then log of the square you can just come out with a two, then this thing can get canceled. So basically the filter quality that's using this equation for two layers of material are going to be the same as one layer of the material. Okay, so the same for the three layers of material. It's gonna be, uh, basically it will have the same filter quality, okay? If you plug in the filtration efficiencies. So by using this equation, um, the filter quality is purely dependent on the material itself. It's not dependent on what is the actual filtration efficiency if we stack multiple layers in there. So in this way, we can isolate the thickness of the material. We'll just focus on what is the performance of the material itself, right? Uh, so that's all for the contents of this class, and uh, let's talk about the backhouse filters um, in more details in our next class, all right? Thank you very much.